Y'all please have be seated. Kayla, praise and worship team. What an outstanding job. Y'all bless my soul this morning. Amen and amen. Happy Memorial Day, church family. It is so good to see you all. Um, brother, Chaplain Bailey, so good to see you, brother. It's been a while, man. Amen. There we go. And I also want to thank uh, Chaplain Ray for the privilege and the honor just to be here and uh, break the bread before it's God's people and also my, my brothers and sisters um, back here. Um, in the booth. I'm sorry getting the scripture to you all late. Y'all to continue to do an amazing job. I bless God for each and every one of you all. Thank you all for the faithful that are here on this four-day weekend. I mean, y'all could be somewhere in this beautiful country with the sun is shining, but y'all chose to come here and fellowship and uh, break, break bread with God's word. Um, the title of my sermon today is Suffering in Purpose suffering in purpose and I understand I, I'm glad I can teach this to you all this morning because it is not something that we usually talk about in church it is not something that's going to make people want to come to church to hear about suffering so we're going to talk about it today amen Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer real quick father we just thank you for your grace we do thank you for your mercy Lord God we thank you for the praises that have gone up, Lord God, and we know that you dwell in the midst of our praise. Even as we continue to worship you and praise you through the scripture and through your word on today, Lord God, I pray that our hearts and our minds be open to hear your word, Lord God, so that we can grow in trust and faith and confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, I recall a couple of years ago when I was uh, talking with then a chaplain assistant we called him Religious Affairs um, NCO, and we got to talking because there was this person that was in leadership. He was talking to this NCO, and he was basically telling him, like, oh, I don't like chaplains too much. And the guy, he had just crossed train into becoming a chaplain assistant, he was taken aback, like, well, the chaplains that I'm around, they're, they're, they're pretty cool. What, what, what's going on? And the backstory behind it was this this uh, person that was in leadership, he had a brother and he was a, a Christian and he confessed it, and, but he had some mental health issues. Make a long story short, this guy, uh, his brother ended up committing suicide and he was hurt by this, he was devastated by this. And every time he would ask a chaplain, how can bad things happen to good people? And a chaplain couldn't really um, answer that. And even as I stand here, I can't answer that. I've been a hospital chaplain for years and years and years and years. And there's so many devastating things that happen to people. And when people ask why, I was like, I do not know. But I know that God promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. And what I love about this scripture is Paul continues to tell us in this text and he says, he doesn't want the church to be ignorant about suffering and that things that he went through and things that we could go through. The scripture says, we thought you ought to know dear brothers and sisters about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. In verse nine, it says, in fact, we expected to die. To die. Commentaries and theologians don't know the exact suffering that Paul went through in Asia, but I like that Paul right here doesn't get into the specifics of what that trouble was. We don't know whether it was family trouble. We don't know if it was ministry troubles. It wasn't, we don't know if it was an illness. We don't know if it was a sickness. We don't know what that trouble was, but it was trouble that was so overwhelming that it felt crushing to his life. Trouble so sorrowful, so overwhelming that this was the great apostle. This was the apostle Paul that continued to transcript and write all kinds of the New Testament. This was the apostle Paul that was responsible for us as Gentiles coming to salvation in Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the troubles that he went through that was so overwhelming that it literally felt like a crushing. That beyond a doubt, a shadow of a doubt, he knew that, you know what, I'm about to die, the trouble that he was going through. I know a lot of times, church, we talk about overcoming fears and having faith as a mustard seed and persevering. But what about when the crushing comes? 
What about when those things that just seem overwhelming to life where, you know what, God, this is too much for me. I don't know about you, but some of us can get to that place in life where, you know what, this is overwhelming. And it's easier said than done. You know, when we go through something, we go through hard times, we, and when we're on the other side, it's like, whew, glad I made it through that. But when you're in the midst of suffering, when you're in the midst of going through, that's where it's hard at church. A lot of you all know I've told my testimony just a little bit is that I was 12 years prior enlisted and I decided that I wanted to get out the military. And I had my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And I mean, I had everything mapped out. I, there was a, um, a company in Atlanta, Georgia called Viasat, and I did satellite, communi satellite communications for 12 years. So I was like, man, this is a shoe in Thank you, God, for opening that door. Thank you, God, for opening my eyes to see what you have for me when I get out the military and what I'm going to do. I know I have something bit of a calling and purpose for serving people and doing ministry, but guess what? I'll do that on Sunday morning, maybe on Saturday. Whoever the pastor is, I will serve that person faithfully, God. But all I need you to do is handle this over here. I mean, I had it mapped out. It was good. And so I step out on faith, and we move out there to Atlanta, Georgia, and months go by, and I get an interview at this Viasat place, and I didn't get the job. They weren't hiring at that time. It was 2009, and the economy was going down. And I wasn't too worried about it because I'm like, God, you know what? You're faithful. So I'm sure another job or opportunity will show up. Well, I end up getting a job at a company called Meridian. It was um, digital audio equipment, very expensive. And I get there and I'm a technician and it's no big deal. It's like, hmm, I can work this out. This will be fine. But then when I look at upward mobility, the person that was in front of me had been there eight years. The person in front of me before, I mean, is and the next person in line had been there 15 years, and the next person had been there 22 years. And I'm looking like, okay, this is not it. What am I going to do? So I decide that, you know what, okay, I'm a, you know, we had the post 9-11 GI Bill, make a little bit more income. I'll go and get my Master's of Divinity and just do something. It's a way to make a little bit more income. That's what I'll do. And all through this process, all through this trials, all through this tribulation, I have a wife and four kids. They eat on a daily basis. <laughs> and I'm wondering, God, what? I know you're, you're, you're up there, but I got some responsibilities down here. What are you doing? I remember one time churches... I used to, we used to go to the grocery store and we used to, um, you know, that we were suffering, we we're living in poverty, we were hurting, but we weren't doing too bad. And we knew there was a lot of people that were doing even worse. But every time we went to the grocery store, we get a little bit of non-perishable so we can take to the food pantry or something like that. I remember one time, church, that I'm dropping stuff off in the food pantry and we have all these bags and I'm dropping it off. And I remember I happened to look in our own pantry at home and I was devastated because I'm like, God, I'm giving away more food than what we have in our own pantry. What are you doing? I thought you called me to purpose. I thought you called me to be blessed. I thought that, you know, I had this job opportunities. God, what in the world are you doing? But it was the crushing. It was those things that were overwhelming in my life in order to steer me towards purpose. Because church, if you ask me way back then when I got out, or you could ask me a couple years later, maybe even after I finished my seminary, if I would have become a military chaplain, and I would tell you no. There is absolutely no way in, in my, the world or anything tracking that I was going to become a military chaplain. It happened to be that through this process and I learned about different programs, I was like, man, I kind of like this. Man, I really enjoy being a chaplain. Wow, to do that as a military chaplain, that'd be pretty cool. And it was all a process that God had the steps ordered for me. But back then, I did not know that. Now I can look back and be like, guys, you're good. 
that was good. I never would have been here. But all the time doing those steps when I did not know what was going on. I did not know God's purpose. I did not know God's plan. And I tell that to you all, church, because there's a lot of times when life seems overwhelming, God is trying to get our attention, right? We don't know. Obviously, we don't know exactly what he's doing, but you still have to trust him in the process. Amen. Amen. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers us out of them all. Sometimes we understand better in retrospect in time. Verse eight continues to say we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. When life seems to be overwhelming, I'm talking about real stuff. I'm talking about when you feel like you cannot make it day to day, let alone a month from now. Church, there are people that are hurting. I mean, people that when life seems to be crushing them inside, not the things that are going on externally, but inside where they feel like they are hopeless. And we have a hope in God. What I love about Paul is he talks about this crush and he talks about this internal things that is going on. But why did God continue to tr crush him? It was so that he could find not his hope in and of himself, but hope in God. A lot of times, even in the military, whether you're a civilian, I mean, they give us all these great tools. They give us all these great principles. I mean, we have, we have uh, flight leaders, we have commanders, we have SELs. Even if we have family members, we have wife, we have kids, we have people that we can lean on. If we're not careful, we find ourselves leaning on people rather than leaning on God. And that's what God was doing in Paul's life. Maybe you're, maybe this crushing, maybe there's things that are perplexed so that, you know what, God, for God, I live and for God, I die. God, either I'm going to trust you or I'm not going to trust you. God, either you're going to deliver me or you're not going to deliver me. God, either you're my hope or you're not. God, either you resurrect the dead things that are in my life, in my marriage, in my, in my, in my circumstances, or you're not. God, which one is it? But you know what? Regardless, I'm going to be found right here trusting in God's word. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They got thrown in the fire. Sometimes we can find ourselves, we're thrown into things, and instead of getting mad, you know what? God, I praise you because you are still right here with me. When we have our eyes open to see that God is still with us, then we're okay. But just like the, the um, maybe just me, maybe just me, I can find myself offended. Like, what? I didn't do nothing to them. How they pushed me into this? I didn't even want none of this. But God, a lot of times, sends us all those, all those different kinds of things so that we can hope. And we can trust in God, the one who resurrects the dead things in our lives. Church, there's a time and there is a season for everything that we go through. Verse 9 continues to say, and in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again we have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us church i so wish that you know those trials those suffering those things that we we go through that it was just a, a one and done kind of thing like all right god check I don't have to go through this ever again. But Paul says he rescued us and he will rescue us again. Sweet baby Jesus. Church, I'm telling you all that because oh, even as a chaplain, I hate going through the trials. I, I hate going through the tribulation. I hate going through those things that perplex me, but it is a part of the process. It is a part of the process so that our hope, our trust is found in him. And church, I say all that also because we also have to be careful of when other people are going through, right? We know that in the military and just in society as general, 
suffering comes to everybody. It is an equal employment opportunity. I don't care, the, care whether you stay in the mansion, you stay in the castle, whether you stay underneath the bridge or in a duplex or a shack. Suffering still comes your way. But we have to find ourselves. Remember the Good Samaritan, right? We had the Levite, you had the priest. They decided that, you know what, I'm not going to go to that side and help this person at all. But it was a Samaritan that decided I'm going to cross over to the other side and help. That's what a lot of times it is when people suffer in life. We want to go to the opposite side and think that, well, I'm not trained, well, I'm not qualified. Guess what, church? It doesn't take much. All people want is a listening ear. All they want to know is that, you know what, I will accompany and see what that need is. They don't always need a counselor. Just know that during the journey that I will be there with you. I'm here to help you. That's what people need in life. And I would also say that, even Jesus understood the suffering. God did not spare him from suffering. And the Bible says that even when Jesus was doing all this ministry, he, had, he, had, he was doing miracles. He had thousands of people following him. Yet when the suffering came, what happened? People departed. The scripture says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will flee. And that's what happens, church. When people go through suffering, a lot of times we flee. Leave them to themselves. Leave them alone where people feel hopeless. And as a church family, that's where we should be the ones that are, I'm going in. Can I do lunch with you? Can we do dinner? How can I help you? How can I walk alongside you in this difficulty? You'll find yourselves that when you're walking with people in, in the life and the difficulties and the tragedies of life, that it kind of puts you at the, at the, in the background. You realize those things that you thought you were going through that seemed overwhelming, you know what? It's not really that bad. And church, I want to encourage you that during the suffering of life, during those things that seem so perplexed, during those things that seem to crush the life out of you, it is so that you find yourself trusting and relying and hoping in God. Life's devastating detours often become the miraculous milestones charting a new path towards God's future for us. Those trying, testing, and crushing we experience in those places is necessary for our advancement. Those crushing, overwhelming, overwhelming circumstances can often feel like they destroy us and derail our journey for what we determined is our destination. We question whether the suffering we're encountering will be the end of all we've accomplished and pursued thus far. We wonder where God is and why he would allow us to hurt so deeply. But these places also reveal there's more to our lives than what we had planned. They force us to reset our compass on our creator. As we look for his guidance and follow his direction, the truly invaluable marvelous and eternal aspects of our identity and ultimate destiny are then displayed. The crushing becomes the creation of something new, church. Amen. If, even if you remember Joseph, right? Joseph, my God, his own kin, his own brothers betrayed him. And if you're not careful, you can find ourselves that God, when things happen to us, we find ourselves, instead of trusting and growing and walking closer to God, we might desert him. God, how could you allow this? How could you allow my brothers to sell me into slavery? How can you have someone lie about me, about my integrity and my character? That's what they did with Joseph. How can you have someone, I'm trying to help somebody, and they're in prison, and I'm trying to do ministry to them and serve them and give them hope, and they forget about me. For years, I'm stuck in this prison. And all the while, God had a purpose and plan for Joseph. And if you listen closely, all the things that I said was pointing at people instead of pointing towards God. And that's what we often do so many times, church. The enemy of our souls try to keep us distracted by looking at people instead of looking up from where our help comes from. If we want true help, the Bible says our help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. 
You have the person that created all things that is available to help as long as we call upon him. As I get ready to close church, Paul said he felt that during this trial, it was a sentence of death that had been passed against him. He was in utter despair and at a complete loss. The idea is there seemed to be no possible way out. Of the afflictions that Paul suffered, both physical and emotional, he would later say, we are experiencing trouble on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Perhaps this was a life lesson that Paul learned while he was in Asia. Verse 11, and I promise I'm going to close for real this time. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously, graciously excuse me, answered so many prayers for our safety. Church, I'm not sure how much you, you, you pray or that if you believe in prayer, but I want to encourage you that Paul gave the solution to every. Yes, he, he learned a life lesson. He learned to stop relying on himself and learn to rely on God. But what happened was it was the saints' prayers. That's why he was rescued. And he encouraged them, please continue to pray for me. Church, continue to pray for people in your community. Continue to pray for those that are in leadership. Continue to pray for those that are in the dorms. Continue to pray for people. Our help comes from the Lord, and God has given us a, a strategic weapon in prayer to pray for people. That's how Paul was rescued. That's how Paul was resurrected from those things that were crushing and perplexing in his life. It was prayer. It was the prayer of the saints, church. Amen. As I close, let us pray. Praise and worship team, y'all come up. Father, we bless you. We magnify you. We give you the honor. We give you the glory. Father, I do pray that you continue to strengthen our hands. You continue to strengthen our feet as we, I pray, Lord God, that we don't grow weary in well-doing. For you said that we shall reap if we faint not, Lord God. So, Father, I pray even now. Continue to strengthen us as we walk for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen.